That's a good, powerful message there, huh? That'll get you going. Well, death is a word that um, is a termination or a lack of life. Um, darkness, as we saw in the video there. Um, and life is the existence of something. Um, and God, the way that God defines life for humanity is as those who are living in their intended purpose. And our intended purpose, we're the only beings that have been given the ability to know God, to be supplied by him in the way that we are enabled to do it. And that's where our life is, is when we are in God, supplied by God in our intended purpose. He refers to those that have worshipped idols. Now, idols can be very different from what it was in the Old Testament, at least in, in our understanding of it. Idols were generally, um, in the Old Testament, were uh, figures of really human figures. It can be animals, though, also at the same point, that were thought to be gods and uh, that they would worship these things that were of stone. But idols are anything that we put in the place of where God should only be, number one, in our lives. So, when he says this, he's, he says he's referring to those that have worshipped idols, that though these idols of stone and wood, though they might have features like humans or animals, though they might have eyes, they can't see. They're stone and wood. And he says those that worship them become just like them. They can't see either. They can still see things, but they can't see God. They might have ears, but they can't hear. Not like they should. Not like intended. They can't hear God. And Jesus is the one who says many times, do you have eyes and cannot see? Or those that have eyes, let them see. Those that have ears, let them hear. He's the one that reverses this curse. Ultimately, what he's basically saying here is that those that worship idols are dead. Though they live, they're really dead. They're worthless. They're not living in their intended purpose. They're not supplied by God and therefore life-giving. Rather, they, though they exist as a person, they're dead to God and worthless. Remain, they remain in the condemnation of the curse from Adam and Eve to die because of their rebellion. So the background, again, um, our letter here today is to the Ephesians church, um, and the sermon series is entitled One, because all things are unified through Christ, though we have been separated and alienated from God by, the, by sin, by the curse, God unifies us in Christ. That's important. Paul, again, is the author And his intent is to help the Ephesian church understand how to come back into the likeness, the fullness of Christ. A couple weeks ago, we started the new section of this Ephesian letter, and it's expanding on that. It's continuing on that. How do we walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we've been called into? And that, that was talked about in Ephesians, the beginning of the uh, fourth chapter. And keep in mind, this is not complicated stuff. This isn't, this isn't you know, uh, advanced Christianity. This is very foundational, simple things. In order to be maturing, we need to be following the instructions that Paul has, has here. This is not complicated, complicated or complex instructions. This is very basic. Last week we continuing, he was continuing, or we're, yeah, continuing the concept of ta taking off the old self and putting on the new self. Put off anger, put on love, forgiveness. And be builders, not destroyers. That's what we left off on. Now, today, we have three sections which instruct us how to truly worship God as we are expected. How to have the life that we were intended from the very beginning. So, first section. We're looking at chapter 5, 
verses 1 through 14, and the first section is uh, 1 and 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, the word therefore is showing, whenever you see therefore, you should always look back because it's saying something, it's continuing something that it just talked about. It's linked. So, it continues from last week's message. Being builders, not destroyers. <clears throat> Be imitators of God. How much more direct can we get of Paul saying, Be like Christ. Follow him. Be imitators of God. And Christ is in the image of God. He is God. So follow the example of God. We're to reflect God in our lives, showing that he has overwhelmed our lives with his nature. We're overflowing with who he is, so much that we become like him. We're adopted by him. We were separated, and he has adopted us back through his son, the Holy Spirit overflows from within and we take on the family likeness. Why? Because we walk with him. We have his presence that is with us. Beloved is a word for the dearly loved, the valued, obedient ones, opposite of the rebellious ones. Disobedience. Shameful. To walk is to live every day. When we journey, that's what they did back then, is they walked everywhere. We didn't drive anywhere back then. They walked. So walk in a manner, um, in the likeness of Christ. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Live in love as Christ loved us. That's pretty strong, right? The love of Christ is pretty powerful, and it's not like the world. This is a selfless servitude for the benefit of others. Remember, Jesus says that the first will be last and the last will be first. Love is the opposite of anger and bitterness. Last week, like we talked about, those things are the fruit of the destroyers. The builders are the ones that embrace love, forgiveness, loving kindness, like Christ did. Can you imagine if, if God held, held a grudge like that? Boy, we'd all be in really bad shape. There would be no building. Be all destruction. God gave himself up for us. He willingly surrendered. He was not conquered. It was his initiative. He gave himself up willingly for our benefit. Surrender is the supreme Demonstration of love. Humble. Opposite of pride. Christ is the foundation, the model. Costly, humble, sacrificial love. Fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. A sac this is a sacrifice that was pleasing to God. In the Old Testament, you hear he, he constantly, in the law, the book of Moses, it says, offering it as a, a fragrant offering that's pleasing to the Lord. Um, that's what this is talking about, an acceptable offering. Jesus shows us how to present ourselves as offerings which please the Lord. That's exactly what Elijah will do at the end. Remember, Elijah was somebody at the end of the Old Testament and coming into the New Testament. Everybody's afraid as far as who, are you Elijah? Even with John the Baptist, who he was a form of the Elijah to come. He was one of them. There's another one to come as well at the end. Elijah to come and in John the Baptist is someone who brings us back to our intended purpose before judgment comes. His message is harsh. And it is painful a lot of times. But it ultimately really is in love. Because the point is, is to bring us back into the love of God. He calls us out saying, get right with God. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. It's close. Get right with God basically is what his intent is. This is very different than the world. 
If we want to be right with God, then that's why God sends the Elijah. That's an extreme example of love, of him saying, before I come in destruction, I want to give you one more chance, one more chance to get right with me. And this one will call out in strength and in force. So how does, how does a good imitator become so good? You've seen them before. I mean, I've seen people do some incredible and imita- I've seen some really bad ones too, but, um, you know, somebody goes, why, why, watch this. You go, what the heck was that? <laughs> but some of them where you're like, oh, wow, that's great. I, I know exactly who that person is. They might imitate whether it be George Bush or Obama or, you know, um, Bill Cosby or something or whatever. You got all kinds and, and you're like, oh, that's so good. How do they get that good? They study those people. Very closely, all the little tiny details, the things that they do, the say, their facial expressions, they study them. If we are in awe of someone or something, then it's natural for us to want to know more about them. We worship them. We are consumed by them. The more that we look at the cross, the more we should be overwhelmed by its awesome divine magnificence. He who is more powerful than everything in creation gave himself up for the benefit of his children. We should be pulled in and infected by it, surrendered to it, overcome by it. Everything we do should be filtered through the lens of Christ. Is it? Do others look at us and see Jesus or just another person who is in the world? How do we run our church? How do we operate at work? That can be challenging, very challenging. How do we raise our families? How do we talk to our friends? How do we talk to our enemies? How do we interact with the world? Two is avoid the things that compel the wrath of God. The first one is uh, focusing more on, in on conduct, the physical and the mind. And these are the first two sections are commands. It says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetedness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. These are things which do not indulge in the self-sacrificial love, but rather self-indulgent sensuality, opposition to God. These are three, it's, a tr- it's the first triad of commands that God has in this section. Sexual immorality is the first one. This is an example of not being committed to covenant faithfulness. Now clearly, marriage is a covenant. Covenant faithfulness, obedience to one. God calls us into a marriage. In fact, he even refers to it with his people, that they are married to me. That you have sometimes broken faithfulness, that you've basically cheated on me, you've committed adultery with me for those that sin against him by worshiping other idols. Covenant faithfulness. The sex is clearly is, is only okay within marriage to God. That's not the way of this world, though. In fact, I would argue, you just turn on the TV, and unless you're having sex with everyone, you're not cool. You're out of the loop. You're missing out. Clearly. That's not the way that God looks at it at all. Not even close. It's exactly the opposite. Covenant faithfulness. Sex is something that is a gift and it's meant to be shared between two, and that's it. Impurity, uncleanliness. It's defined in the Old Testament law best. And I know a lot of people don't like to go through this, but this is the book of Leviticus. Some people are like, oh, I love, you know, reading through the Bible is great, but as soon as I get to Leviticus, man, I just, oh, Leviticus. Leviticus is showing us what it means to be pure, to be clean before God, to be cleansed of unrighteousness. 
That's important. When you see, see that, it really is pretty fascinating on how it's being done, how God shows that that needs to happen before him. In order for his presence to dwell among us, we need to be cleaned. We need to be purified. He's pure. That's why he says, be holy because I am holy. It's important. One of the main purposes of the Levites, who were one of the 12 children of Jacob, Remember, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob had 12 children. Um, these are the ones that were saved from Israel, the descendants of Jacob's 12 children. One of them were Levites. Levites, in the book of Mo books of Moses, we see are made to be priests of God's people, of Israel. And one of the main purposes, one of them, it says specifically in the book of Leviticus that you are to teach people what it means to be holy. The difference between clean and unclean. My people are clean. And it doesn't necessarily mean what we would think that it means. They need to learn these things. That's the point of the priests. They also did sacrificial and so forth, but that also was to purify them, to teach them how to be right with God, ultimately. To be holy. Covenantness. Greediness is what that is, the third one on there, and that's what the picture shows right there. Those little tiny fish, look at the big one that he's got. I want what he has. I wish I had a fish like that. Must be content with what God gives us. We've got to be careful about any teacher, pastor, priest, whatever, that teaches anything different than that. That is very clear throughout the Bible. Whenever you hear somebody say, God just wants you to be rich, wants you to be happy. Well, he does want you to be happy, but our happiness is only going to be found in him. And if we think that we're only going to be happy when we have a lot of money, that is not of God, that he wants your business to succeed, that he wants you to be you know, financially secure and stuff. No, God is our provider, and some of us are going to have a life that is going to be not in rich abundance. And we got to be okay with that. Because there are people out there in all different areas that need God, and we got to be able to reach out to them. We have to be okay and knowing that God is good no matter what we have. And He knows what we need, and He doesn't give us always what we want, but He gives us what we need. And we have to be okay with that. We don't, covet, we don't covet what other people have. What we have, we realize God has given me what I need. And sometimes we say, I really don't need to be going through what I'm going through right now. But how do we know that? What if some of this is prepping us for what God has laid ahead of us? It's submitting to him saying, you're God, not me. I'm, I'm not going to question you. I might not be happy with it but I'm submitting to it and I'm surrendering to it and saying, let your will be done, but please just provide for me my needs. And he says, I will. I will not abandon you. Therefore, the things, these things are not even to be named among you. They're detestable to God. Not even to come to mind. The saints are those that are holy to God. Um, separated to him, part of his family. So continuing, let there be no filthiness, filthiness, no foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are all out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. This is continuing the call, but focused on more of the speech element. This is the second triad of the commandments. So filthiness is obscenity, indecent, lewd, offensive, repulsive. The best word for this is shamefulness. And in fact, this word shamefulness comes back later again in the text. I wish that they would have continued because it's the same exact word, same root, but they decided to use two different words for the interpretation. It doesn't change the meaning, but you at least start to see the literary pattern that are, that's going on here. Shamefulness. Let there be no shamefulness, no foolish talk. So foolish talk, many false prophets go into foolish talk. Foolish talk is the way of the world. Wisdom of God is revealed in his word, especially in Proverbs, but throughout the whole Bible is the wisdom of God. And the only way that we understand it is by submitting to him and surrendering to him. I got to say, before, before I surrendered to God, I read his Bible and I, I could, I mean, I kind of knew the stories. I, I was familiar with them. 
but it was rough reading through that thing. You know, I was like, okay, I know I should read the Bible, but boy, it's just rough. I don't understand a lot of it and stuff. But as soon as I surrendered my heart, really, truly to him, where I was like, God, I'll, I'll go wherever you, wherever you lead me to, whatever that means, I'll do it. All of a sudden, he opened my eyes to it in a ways that I never, ever saw before. And I still had a lot to learn, but it was amazing the difference between before that time and after. That's the Holy Spirit at work in there. It is very powerful. But foolish talk is the ways of the world. There still are many priests and prophets that talk and teach foolishly. They look like people of God, like his representatives, but they aren't at all. Crude joking, all three of these items refer to dirty a dirty mind expressing itself in vulgar conversation, totally inappropriate for God's people. Completely. In contrast to both of the triads of vile conduct and speech is command for thanksgiving, for gratefulness. This is a total different attitude. Rather than self-centeredness, it's a heart of gratefulness for what God is, what he's done, what he's doing, and what he promises to do. Gratefulness. And sometimes it is hard to be grateful for where we're at. Sometimes it's, but what is that also? Instead of relying on him, recognizing that he is in control, we're looking at ourselves. We need to remember that he is good and that he is trustworthy. And there probably is, he's doing something good in that and will, I should say. It might not feel like it right now, but he is and will. So the next section is conduct. This is a warning. These next two parts here are warnings. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, covetous, that is an idolater. So any of these things, this goes back to the triad, the first triad that we just saw. Anyone, all of these fit into idolatry. All of them. Idolatry is a big category. I know a lot of people, they think, oh, idolatry. I don't worship any kind of stone images, so I'm good. I don't got to worry about that. No, idolatry fits a lot of things. And we do it today in America more than probably any other sin that there is. We worship ourselves more than we worship God. We can worship our family, our jobs, money, all kinds of other things above and beyond God. And sometimes the pain that we go through is him illuminating to us that we have idolized one of those things. They can all be good things. We need to work. We need to love our family. We need to be responsible, but not put them above where he's only supposed to be. That can be tricky. If we're not careful, we will idolize other things. We're idol-making machines, but he's the only one we're supposed to be idolizing, worshiping. We have to be careful of that one. If we're not, we'll fall victimized into it. And isn't this important? It says here, the last part, that those have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. When it says, you may be sure of this, Paul's saying this is absolutely, beyond a doubt, completely true. This is not debatable. This is absolutely true. Um, remember that Matthew 7 21 says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That always gives me chills whenever you hear, when I hear that. But only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Even the miracle workers who seem to be of me, they must know Jesus. They must walk with him. They must be reflecting him. He must know them. They must know him. They must be journeying together, walking with each other, just because they can do some great things, just because they can speak real nice, just because they can do some things that seem like they're part of God, that they are from him, does not mean that they are. We only really can sniff them out by understanding God's likeness. And then we can see that's not like God at all. That is like God. That might be tough to hear, but it is of God. 
We only know God's likeness through his word. We need to know his word. So the last part of it is again, is paralleling the second triad here, going back to the speech. Let no one deceive you with empty, vain. Empty is vain words, worthless words, going back to that whole concept. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the, sin, or the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. Empty words are foolishness. Don't get sucked into it. There are those which are not from God and we much must know his word to understand his likeness and sniff these things out. Um, we, we all know, we all hear these preachers. There, there's preachers out there that, they, that I've heard them say and it just it drives me nuts every time I hear it. They say, well, God is now is not, the God of the New Testament isn't like the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament is wrathful and hateful and punishment and, and judgment. But that's not God anymore. After Jesus came, now he's the God of love. Wrong. He's always been both. From the beginning to the very end. He says, I don't change. He might reveal his plan more, but both are there. He is cosmic judge. No one who sins will pass by him. No one. Not one. He is cosmic judge and hates sin, but he also loves to show mercy. He wants to show mercy. And he's shown us in his word that the way that he gets us back to his love is in covenant. Initially, it was through the law of Moses. He showed them how to come into his love. And through Jesus, he shows them how to come back to his love also. And Jesus says, follow me. And you will have it. I don't want to judge you. In fact, I'm even going so far to sacrifice myself to, to give you God's love. But follow me. Surrender to me. You have surrendered to a different king. You need to come into this kingdom. We need to surrender to the king. That's important, very important. God is love, but he also is our judge, and he wants to love us. That's why he sent his son, to show us the degree, how far he was willing to go to do it. But that's not all he is. If we just fill in him as love, and he's no longer the God of wrath, we fall into his wrath because we're not careful about staying in his love. That's why those preachers are false prophets because they're killing people. People say, well, I can do whatever I want. God's love. He's not going to judge me. Everyone will really be saved. There's no condemnation at the end. Everybody will be saved. No, they won't. There's a small handful is what his word says. Walk the narrow path through the narrow gate because wide is the one that most people will go through and they will not enter into heaven. Come into his love. And if someone tells us that they remind us of somebody else, like if someone says, oh, that person reminds me of my, your brother. I know my brother. I've lived with him. And I'll be looking, and both of them, and I'll be looking for the things that show what his likeness is, right? It's the same thing with God. The visual isn't enough. A priest or a pastor that dresses, whether it be with a collar or whatever the case is, that looks like a pastor and molests children is not God's representative. That is a person that has bowed to Satan. No doubt. They might wear the collar, but they are not one of God's children. But we will be fooled by that and bitter then at God because that has happened. There are many things in this world that deceive, that look like the real thing, but they're not the real thing. And we can sniff those out by knowing his word. Do we know it? We have to start somewhere. Why not start with the Bible study? That's the perfect place to do it. Learn the techniques and the patterns of reading it. Then allow God to reveal himself to us. Then the false deceptive prophets have no ground to stand on. They're easy to sniff out. Teachers and priests become evident by their fruit. Okay, the last section. Walk as children of the light. So the first section says, for at one time you were in the darkness, or you were darkness. Oops. Not in it. You were darkness. But now you are light of the Lord. 
Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. If we were once in darkness, consumed by it, what that means, then we, were, we used to do the things that Paul was just explaining, and we all have, one way or the other. But now, if we are of the light, then we must walk as such. Walk in the light if we are of it. If we live in a new country or a kingdom, right? We're expected to follow the rules of that kingdom. If we don't, whew, we get kicked out or thrown in jail, right? Because we're rebelling against it. It's the same idea here. The fruit of the light is what's good, right, and true. That's what God is. If we know who God is, then we know what is good, right, and true and can live in accordance to it in a way that pleases God. It says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. This is opposed to the fruit of light. So take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it's shameful to even speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Shameful. This is where you see the shameful word come back into play. For it is shameful. Same thing as earlier. Same word exactly that is used in uh, verse 4. Expose, bring to light is what this means. So when we live as people of children, the children of God, children of the light, wickedness and darkness will be exposed. Envy, greed, sexual immorality, foolish talk, arguing, anger, etc. These are all the destructive nature will be illuminated. Not only within the individual, but also to others. It will come to the forefront. Why do you think the demonic was so evident when Jesus came? Notice that in the Bible, there's not a whole lot of talk about, the, about demons, and, and they're in there, but it's not a lot. New Testament, it's everywhere. He was possessed by a demon. There was a demon here. Satan was there. Everywhere. You think he just showed up all of a sudden? That's when, G, when Satan was created? No. His presence, God's presence brought it, stirred him up. They like to hide in the darkness. They love it when we don't recognize them, when they stay more quiet and soft. When the light comes, though, it stirs them up and it brings them to the forefront. Our church has had different things that we've dealt with recently. Um, God's doing a good work here. He is. I know it. But he's going to bring stuff up. There's going to be things that come up. It's bringing it to the light so that we deal with it. We heal from it. That it's exposed. Needs to be exposed. They were always there. And they can't hide in the shadows anymore. That's a good thing. Shadow is where evil likes to dwell. Hiding. The light has nothing to hide. Problem though as far as for Christians is that uh, a lot of times they see this text and then they go out looking for people to condemn. Right? <laughs> you are a sinner. You need to get right with God. Right? They're trying to be John the Baptist. The Elijah to come. Um, remember Matthew 7, chapter, or verse 3. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that is in your own? You have a tree in your own eye, and yet you want to remove the little speck of dust in your friend. Let me get that for you. That, that You've got a tree hanging out of your eye. You've got some issues to deal with. Why are you picking other people apart? First, when we come into the light, part of the reason why we're transformed is so that God can do a work in us. It's exposed so that we can be healed. And let me basically bring it to this. This is, um, well, I'll read this last part of the verse and then get in because I know we're, we're basically at the end of time. It says, Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. It's talking about, it's referring back, if you want a passage uh, to look at throughout the week, Isaiah 26 is what this comes from. And it's basically talking about how God um, works in a person's life and that those that are sinners, they don't see God. They're blinded by him. 
And it talks about as far as giving, even sometimes inflicting the pain to open their eyes that they might submit to God and let him do a healing in them. And he says, just like in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 37, he says, though you are dead, my people, you're a bunch of dry bones, dead, with no hope. I will speak my spirit into you and you will live. I will give you life. That's what Christ does, is that he gives us life. As he raised from the dead, he calls us to rise from the dead, rise from the darkness, to come into the light. To give us a, a visual of what this is, imagine us all in a theater, kind of a, a thing, and, and there's one spotlight that's shining down, and it's powerful. And we're sitting in the audience, so we're in the darkness. And then we hear a voice, a very loud, very powerful voice, and maybe we're the only one to hear it, but it calls our name. Come up here. And we're going, no, I don't want to come in here. Leave, go, 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 go. Derek, come up here. Trying to block it out, block it out, block it out. Eventually, the pain, the sound, the terror is so intense that we come. We come into the light and it cripples us to our knees because all of our impurities are seen, everything. All of our pain and our hurt and our imperfections are visual. visual. But at the same time, we feel this warmth, love surround us and pick us up. And our knees get stronger. We can stand. And we feel those things leave us. Purification, strengthening, a joy, a fullness that comes. And then we start to see that other people are being called up into the light. And instead of pointing at them and saying, you need to get right with God, we have our hands out to them and asking them to come up. Sometimes even showing them where the stairs are to come up. We stay in the light because we don't want to go back to the darkness. But we help other people into it as well. We are meant to be light. To know it, why would we ever want to go back? Why would we ever want to go back to the darkness? That is what this message is. To live, to rise from the dead, to embrace the light, to be God's people. So the proposition here today is that God's worshipers will overflow with and reflect his nature, which is light. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this message. We thank you for the fact that you are good, that you are light, that shines in the darkness, Lord, that you don't abandon us to the darkness, to the things that can suffocate, that can bind us, Lord. And the very thing that sometimes still even can, can strangle and choke even us that are in this room here is that we just need to let go. We keep holding on to that what we know. And the way that we overcome it is by letting go so that we can hold on to you with both hands, with everything that we got. And you will strengthen us. We'll be able to overcome. We'll be able to come into your likeness and reflect you as we were always meant to do and have life. Life, true life, eternal life, which starts now. Pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.